Okay, so today we lean in and we're going to do an introductory on Joseph. It's, um, it's a little bit shorter teaching because of all that's going on, but it's really important. It's incredibly important that we get the backstory on Joseph before we lean in. Here's the deal. Anybody here remember the Cold War? Yeah, a few of us, like, was that last winter when we had a fight? No. There was this awesome thing called the Cold War. Probably wasn't awesome, but I was a kid, so it seemed cool, where the Russians and the Americans were building massive nuclear arsenals, and we were trying to see who would blink. You know, you had the, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is a whole different thing. But here's what happened. Back in the day, the CIA would look for snoops and um, different people, the KGB from the Soviet Union, we were trying to get people into the United States to be spies. And when, you would, when the CIA would do a background on somebody, they wouldn't just look at somebody, okay? Let's say the CIA was going to look into Joseph and see, you know, kind of who this guy is. What would they do? They would lean in and they would look into, well, their associates. Who does this person hang out with? They would look into who they work for. They would look at their education, see if they had any certain leanings in any different direction. Um, who have they worked with in the past? They would look at um, where they went to school. They would, they would find out what sports interest and different teammates said about them. They would really dig in, create a dossier on who this person is, and then they would really take a close look at their family members and find out who is this person because in psychology terms, we know that systems create systems. If you're part of a family system, most likely you'll reproduce in some version that system. You may think, no. Has anybody ever been doing something and think, oh my word, I'm my dad? Anybody? Yeah. Or a, a girl like doing something and like uh, they're standing there and like, oh, I'm standing like my mom does, right? These are behavioral things we learn. Systems create systems. So they look deeply into the background, especially the family, to find out who they are. In order to really do Joseph justice, when we read Scripture, what we need to do in this is read what comes before Genesis 37. Really unpack the fact that Joseph is in direct lineage to the God of Abraham. Anybody know who he is? Father Abraham, yeah. Anybody want to do a song with me? Many sons, yeah. yeah. All right, uh, many sons have Father Abraham. So Abraham, his son Isaac, and Jacob. Joseph is a son of Jacob, okay? So, so Joseph is in direct lineage to this great patriarchal family. And what we have to do is look back at that family and realize that what we're studying is a study of brokenness. And when we look at them, we're gonna do this a little bit differently today, okay? I'm not gonna have as many prompts on the screen. The scripture will be up there. But we're just gonna teach our way through the scripture to get a look at this. And I want you to, to just know this. It's a profession of faith Sunday. Super positive, happy. This is a janky story. It feels balky right here to read it. You're like, oh, these are people in the Bible? Like they should be on Jerry Springer. But it's important, and if you stick with me till the end of it, there's, well, stick with me. So, uh, verse 35, or chapter 35. Then God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel and settle there and build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother, Esau. Well, there's your first hint. I don't know about you. I had a big brother. Mine's name was Lincoln, and Lincoln put the beat on me, okay? If I was a drum, I would have been in line. Just My brother and I fought a lot. I never won. My brother and I would get, like, rough with each other and stuff. But there were times I ran for my brother. Anybody else? Like, you do something. I remember one time I cold cocked him, and I hit him because he did the thing where he's like, okay, I'll let you hit me, and he flexed his stomach. I'm like, well, your giant head's right there. Boom! And then... Um, <laughs> Well, he's just like, Ugh! I'm like, this is awesome. So I drilled him, and, you know, what happens? I got on my horse. I mean, I was running. I was like, oh, gosh. Why? Because he was chasing me. This is the first kind of weird introductory. Did you notice? God said to Jacob, go to Bethel and settle there and build an altar to God, who appeared to you when you were running from your big brother Esau. And you think, ooh, what did Jacob do? Like, what, what kind of dirty activity did Jacob do? Jacob was the second born, which is a big deal in this time of life, okay, in this 
kind of historical perspective. He was a twin. Esau was his twin brother. And when Esau was born, he came out just seconds ahead of Joseph. And Joseph had his little red foot by his hand. And he was holding on to Esau as they came out of the womb. And they named Joseph as a heel grabber, someone who's always trying to get something. A heel grabber, a deceiver. And what Joseph, or what Jacob had done is Jacob had deceived and tricked his older brother throughout his whole life. I mean, he really had owned Esau. At one point, Esau's starving, he thinks, to death because, oh, I'm so hungry. And, jo- and Jacob says to him, hey, how about this? I'll give you a bowl of stew if you'll sell me your birthright. He's like, I'm so hungry. What does it matter if I have a birthright if I'm dead? You know, and you're like, oh, were they in middle school? But um, so he's like, okay, so he gives him the soup. Esau eats it. And Jacob has stolen his birthright. Then when his father, when uh, when Jacob's father Isaac or or was very old, he stole his brother's um, uh, blessing, the blessing of the firstborn. He deceived his father into blessing Jacob as though he were the firstborn. This is a really big deal. Because when you steal the blessing of the firstborn, the entire estate goes to the firstborn. And he just made Esau... Uh, a poor man. Oh, Esau was ticked, and that's why he was running. Jacob had always been, well, he was a heel grabber. He was a deceiver, and he would um, he would do whatever it took to get ahead. So, verse 2, so Jacob said to his household and all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves. Change your clothes, then come, let's go to Bethel where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. So his family gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings in their ears, and Jacob buried them under the oak at Shechem. Then they set out, and terror, the terror of God fell on all the towns around them so that no one pursued this, pursued them. So did you pick up on that? Jacob's already encountered God. God's saying, go back to the place I once met you. Go back to that place and, and follow me. Like, come back. And he has to do what? If we're going to go see God, we should probably put away all our foreign gods. It tells us this, Jacob might not be the best leader, the best dad. He's deceived his family, but now even after he's met God, he has, well, he's kept his foreign gods. He's kept the idols. They were pagans. They were living as people outside of having their focus on God only. And what I recognize in this is he knows God intimately. If you look at verse three, it says, let us go after he says, get rid of your foreign gods. Let us go to the place to build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress. He knew God. He knew God, yet he allowed people around him to serve other gods. This Jacob seems to be as shady as they get. And we look at it and go, oh my goodness. He's already encountered God. And that God who made promises to Abraham and Isaac is now making promises to Jacob. And Jacob seems thoroughly unworthy of the promise. His family is pagan. So verse 6 goes on to say, Jacob and all the people with him came to Luz, and that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan. And there he built an altar, and he called the place El Bethel. Here's super important. El. Has anybody ever heard the term Elohim? Okay, it's a Hebrew word. It means El it's a term for God. El is a term, E-L is a term for, uh, for deity in the ancient Canaanite world. And he called it El Bethel, the place where I met God. So I just think that's really cool. Um, so he says, because it was there that God re- re- revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. Now, Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died and was buried under the oak outside of Bethel. So it was named Alam Bakuth the oak of weeping. All right. Anybody here ever have a babysitter when you were little? Okay. Did you, the rest of you just get left home alone and be feral? <laughs> Who had a babysitter? Work with me. There we go. Oh, oh my word. That's awesome. I ought to ask questions twice here. All right. So um, here's the weird thing. Rebecca's not married to Jacob. Rebecca is Jacob's mom. Deborah's his, like, nanny. Jacob's a grown man, and his nanny's still with him? 
right? You can kind of look at it and go, well, Jacob's kind of a doorknob in this, isn't he? He's, what? His nanny's still here? His mom's nurse is traveling with him? Do we have a sniffly nose? Like, it seems a little strange to me that that's put in there. Maybe she was kind of a grandma figure. She'd probably been his, his nanny, his nursemaid. She'd probably taken care of him. There's this weird thing going on, but she's mentioned significantly within this text. And it does show really two things. One of the things it shows is that um, God shows time and again that no one is insignificant in his story. And he gives a woman without a beginning a very prominent place in the lineage and the activity of God's people. So that's really cool. But the other thing it tells us is Joseph still had his nanny with him. And it's just kind of weird. It's just a little weird. I mean, seriously, you think like the God of Abraham, Isaac, and let's just jump a generation and go to Joseph at this point, right? Because Jacob's not really getting it done. But we don't. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of. He's a great patriarch of our faith. Let's read on. Verse 9, after Jacob returned to Padan Aram, God appeared to him again. Side note, he returned to him again. If you read devotions this week, which we publish devotions and we put them at the exits where you can grab them on the way out or you can find them at foundrychurch.net. If you read the devotions, you will know how significant that little word again is. It's really significant in this. He appeared to him again and blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob which means he grasps at the heel, he deceives. But you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. He struggles with God, so he named him Israel. Here's the thing. There's a better translation for that. The accurate translation is he clings to God. He clings to God, holds on tight. When our oldest son would be babysat by my mother-in-law when he was a baby, they had to take her pictures off the wall. Because he would be like, oh, there she is. I miss her so much. And he would just break apart. Now, he didn't say that because he was a baby. But he, would, he couldn't even see her picture. Her likeness would undo him. He clung. He loved her. He loved her. He clings. That's Jacob. He clings to God. His new name is not deceiver or heel grabber. It's one who clings to God. One who gets him in the grip and is like, no, and will not let go. Holds tight to God. He clings to God is his new name. This idea of Israel being in a struggle with God, a struggle clinging to God. I I mean, his name goes from Jacob to Israel. We know Israel as a nation state in the Middle East. That's where it got its name. Uh, They are the children of Israel, the children of the man who was once Jacob, given a new name by God, Israel, to cling and to struggle with God. And I believe that that name has stuck with the Hebrew people throughout all of Scripture. And what we can do is this name change for Jacob was personal. It's not the first time he was given this name by God, but the second time it stuck. He is no longer grasping and deceiving. He is someone who clings to God. Verse 11, and God said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you and kings will be among your descendants. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I also give to you. And I will give this land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him at the place where he had talked with him. Jacob there set up a stone pillar at the place where God had talked with him, and he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it, and Jacob called the place where he had talked to God Bethel. Bethel. And then come the death of Rachel and Isaac. So we move into this section of Scripture now where two people who are critical in Jacob's life die, his dad and his wife But this is also where the story takes a crazy hard turn and then a bunch of other weird turns. It gets really squirrely here. And here's why. Rachel was one of Jacob's wives, which means there were more. Jacob, after he deceived Esau, he leaves because Esau is going to kill him. And um, he goes to this land and he meets a man named Laban. And Laban has two daughters. One's pretty good looking and the other is meh. And he goes for Rachel, the one who's pretty good looking. He goes after Rachel and he makes a deal with Laban. I want your daughter. And Laban says, work seven years for me. 
green light, I'll do it. He worked seven years. This is the ancient world. So at the wedding ceremony, her face was veiled. It would have been dark. He couldn't see her. The next morning when he woke up, he saw, you know, there next to him was meh, Leah. And he goes to this man who had deceived him. And he's like, yeah, I got that one, but I worked for that one. And he goes, here's the deal, Jacob, or Jacob, work for me. Seven more years for Rachel. Oh, love. He goes straight to work. Seven more years. And then he gets Rachel. This is fun. He married sisters. Oh, you're good with that. I mean, maybe we're at the wrong church. He married sisters. He married the older, meh, and the younger, ooh. And, um, and he had these two sisters together in the same house. You don't like your sister now? <laughs> oh, this got janky in a hurry. He's married both of them, and one of them he loves, and the other one is meh. And they start into this contest of giving him heirs because in that day and age, a male heir was everything. And they start trying to give heirs and give, um, give people to their, their husband, give young men to carry on the lineage. And um, what's amazing about this is after all of this, Jacob has 12 sons. Jacob ends up with 12 sons and a daughter, but not by two women. Why make it easy? They were in such a contest for Jacob's affections that Rachel gave him Bilhah, her maidservant, and Leah gave him her maidservant, and they both bore sons to Jacob. Springer, party of 17, right? (laughs) This is in the Bible. This is the Bible. This is the family, the great patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and what's going on, Jacob? This is amazing. This is in the Bible. And we see that the death of Rachel and Isaac would be a pivotal moment in the life of Jacob, now Israel. It says they moved from Bethel, verse 16. While they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel, the one Jacob loved, um, began to give birth and had great difficulty. And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, do not despair, you have been given another son. And as she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named him Ben-Oni, son of my trouble. But his father named him Benjamin, son of my right hand. Think about that. If you've ever been called names in school, if you've ever been mocked, you know those names stick with you. You know those names stick with you. Rachel is dying in childbirth, and she names him son of my trouble. And what does Israel do? He knows that names matter, and he says, wait, that is Benjamin. That is the son of my right hand. My right hand is my strength. It's my sword hand. It's my defense. He is the son of my strength and my vitality. He gives him a new name. You can almost see that Jacob knew what it was life like to go through life as one who was a grasper and a deceiver, and he would not have a name like that laying on his son. He would redeem him with a name immediately. One cool fact, Paul the apostle is of the tribe of Benjamin and the Hebrew people. Anyways, this is, um, this is the son of his right hand, Benjamin. And you see Jacob taking hold of this identity and saying, no, 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 you're not giving him that. I'm going to name him with purpose and with strength and integrity. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem, which isn't amazing how all this circles. I mean, Bethlehem, the place where Christ was born. Over her tomb, Jacob set up a pillar, and to this day, that pillar marks Rachel's tomb. Israel moved on again and pitched his tent beyond Migdal Edir. Oh, I can't pronounce that. While Israel was living in the region, Reuben went and slept with his father's concubine, Bilhah, and Israel heard of it. It's like they're on a pub crawl. Um, I don't need to say much here. It's just terrible. All right, but then it goes on that Jacob had 12 sons. The sons of Leah are Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob, Simeon, Levi. Levi, the tribe of Levi, the high priest, Levi. Judah, Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. So we see these names are coming up. These are the sons of Leah. In case you're not picking up, these are the tribes of Israel. 
These are the 12 tribes. The sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin, the sons of Rachel's servant, Bilhah, Dan and Naphtali, the sons of Leah's servant, Zilpah, Gad and Asher. What a wonderful family reunion. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padam Aram. And Jacob came home to his father Isaac in Mamre near Kith Arabah, that is Hebron. We know Hebron in the current news, um, where Abraham and Isaac had stayed. Isaac had lived to 180 years old. Then he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, old and full of years. Look at this beautiful ending to the life of Isaac and his sons, Esau and Jacob buried him there, no longer at war. So this family that Joseph was born into was a janky and messed up in ways. Like, who here feels better about their family right now? Who here's like, mm, preach. Feels so good to hear about people in the Bible. Because you look at this and realize nothing good could come of that. But what we know is this, the brokenness, the other gods, the deceptions, all somehow make the man that Joseph, who we will study, they make this man, Joseph, and you will find character in him, and it will almost be shocking. It's like licking a battery. You'll know about it, because you're going to be like, wow, how does this happen? How does this come out of that system? I thought systems create systems unless God is in the business of giving new names. That's where we grab on. That's where we hold on because we need to apply this story to our life because you and I have lives with as hopefully not as much wreckage emotionally as this family did. But I won't make you raise your hand today to admit you have a family with a lot of brokenness in it. There's brokenness, there's been deception, there's been illicit activities, there's been drunkenness, abuse, failures in every corner of life. Your kids have failed, the adults have failed, and you just sit there and you go, oh, good, good, the Bible looks like me too. And this is why I say to people, don't come to church to find once you're right. Come in here filthy and dirty because that's how it started. Broken people meeting a holy God. You are not here because you're perfect. You're here because he's perfect and he redeemed you. And there's an application for our life. What can we learn about God that will apply to us out of this? And I think it's pretty easy. The first thing is this. For the Jacobs and the Rachels, for the parents over family systems who have created an environment of abuse, of neglect, or brokenness, I want to say something to you. If you're part of a system, if you're the head of a system, like Jacob and Rachel were, that is mangled, and I want you to use that word mangled, messed up, jacked up, ruined, ugly, nobody look at it because it'll make you get gag, mangled. If you're part of that, I want you to take heart today. If you're a parent who has failed, if you have failed as a parent in being a godly example and different things, I want you to take heart today. You too have been given a new name. You're not a deceiver, heel grabber, failure. Your past doesn't define you nearly as much as the blood of Christ will if you'll cling to it. If you'll cling to it. You have been given a new name. You've been given a new identity in Christ. And just like Jacob, you can live into that identity fearlessly and courageously. Remember, no matter how you failed, you and your children are not a lost cause. Because if lost causes are written, they're in that chapter, 35, of Scripture, where there's four women giving birth to two to one man, two of them are wives, two of them are servants, and everything goes sideways from there. That's a story of tragedy. Somehow God wove it into the story of the gospel. If you think you're beyond saving because you're a failure as a leader in your own home, I want to say this, God still gives new names. God still calls us to his purposes. You can be grafted into God's family. You can submit your life to God's leadership and serve your family as Christ serves the church. You're not bound to your past. There are, no, er, there are earthly consequences for bad decisions, but it doesn't mean it's the end of the story. Start today walking with God, living under a new name. But also, if there's kids out there, if there's children in these systems, for you kids who grew up in systems that were janky and messed up and weird, and maybe you grew up and left and you went, my family's a dumpster fire, and you realized how much damage was done and stuff, I want you to hear me today. Maybe you identify with Joseph or with Benjamin or one of the other kids in the story. Maybe you identify and feel like you were born into a family dynamic that was a train wreck, but it wasn't your fault. You need to understand something that we learned from the life of Joseph this summer. You need to understand that God is still in the business of redeeming brokenness in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Out of this family comes the tribe of Judah, and out of the tribe of Judah comes the one and only, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are bound to that name. We are owned by that name. You are not owned by your family system. You are part of a new family system, and that system, well, Jesus said, go into the world, make disciples of all nations, is creating systems. We're creating new believers, not out of our brokenness, but out of his goodness. We lean in today. You are not cursed to repeat your family system. You are not cursed to it. You are called to give your life to Christ. Cling to his name. Cling to his character. Cling to his reputation because his reputation is flawless. I love that in the, in the video, I think it was Carly who said um, that, that I, Jesus died for me because I'm a sinner but he isn't. Jesus is not a sinner. Jesus doesn't bear our brokenness. He was tempted in every way as we are, yet he went unbroken by sin. Take on Jesus' name. You're a Christian. With God as your father, the Holy Spirit is your guide. Take it on and let him create a new identity in you that isn't gripped by the deceitful, deceiving, heel-grabbing history you have of getting something for you. Grab on and cling to the name of God that was given to you. You are a Christian. You are Christ to the nations. You are the living embodiment of the church by the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but I'm really, really glad for stories like this. As we study Joseph, I promise you this, the text of scripture will spring to life and we will realize that the family Jesus came from is very broken. And the sin in this world is very real, but we can't forget what happened on the last night of Jesus' life. We can't forget to cling to that which gives us life. We can't forget that Jesus was dead serious when he gathered 12 men around him who were broken, tax collectors and fishermen and, and just different people, terrible people, 12 misfits. Do you see it? The tribes of Israel, apostles of Christ, the 12 misfits. Jesus gathered 12 misfits to him at one point and he said to him, He said to them, this is my body. See, Jesus calls us not to a religious practice, but to himself. And today, that's what I'm calling you to. Out of your old identity and grab on to a hope that sustains in spite of who you are. And a hope that gives purpose because of who loves you. Because today we come to communion. And when we come to communion, we do so in remembrance in relationship and in hope. We come in remembrance that the Lord Jesus Christ was sent into this world by God the Heavenly Father to fulfill all obedience to his divine law that came through the family of Israel. And he would fulfill all obedience to the brutal end of death on a cross. But by the death of Christ, by his resurrection, and by his ascension, Jesus Christ secured for you and me a name-changing covenant that is rooted in grace and reconciliation. And that grace and reconciliation says this, there's nobody who isn't welcome at this table as long as Christ is their Lord. Jesus secured for you and I a covenant that would last an eternity of grace, forgiveness of your sins, and reconciliation, making right what is broken. And he did it by his own shed blood. But we also come to this place today to have relationship with Jesus. I don't understand all the mysteries of communion. I just know this, that Jesus Christ said, abide in me. Stay close to me. And he taught his disciples to stay close. And remember that he, Jesus, is the broken body, the bread of heaven that strengthens you and I into life eternal. And that life begins presently. He also reminds us in John 15 that he is the true vine in whom we must stay attached if we are to bear any fruit. And the fruit of the Christian life is new people coming to know Christ. Our witness expanding and bringing those who don't know Jesus in. If we're going to be fruitful, we must be connected to the Lord Jesus Christ. We must remember that he is the one who said, I will be with you always, even to the very end of the age. You're not in this alone by religious duty, but by relational right. You've been brought in as a son or daughter. And finally, we come here in hope, in the hope that we who are such a mess, we are such a mess, if we are honest. We are just messed up people. But if we who are so messed up can come to Jesus Christ, that we, by this little taste of bread and this little taste of juice, are participant in the chorus of heaven, that Jesus Christ said, 
to eat and drink of it in remembrance of him, remembering that his blood was enough for your sin. His broken body was shattered so that you could have new life in him. We remember and we come in hope because this hope tells us that this isn't all there is. This life leads to a life yet to come, and that life yet to come is seen in the smallest little lens right here, in the smallest little table, in a taste of bread and a taste of juice that is a foretaste, the tiniest appetizer of the world-splitting chorus that will happen one day when God gathers all of the church from all time to himself. Billions of us gather around, and we receive our first visual of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see him high and lifted up, and not only do we see him, we're made like him. All that has broken you, fall, broken, been broken in you falls away, and all that is Christ fills you. And we become like him, made into his image, no longer held by our sinful past, but held in the grip of grace. My friends, we come here today because of the hope of Christ, the hope born in us by his sacrifice. My friends, today we take communion, knowing that as messed up as we are as families, we are not beyond the grace and redemption of Jesus Christ. Amen? On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he said to his disciples, this is my body, it's broken for you. As often as you eat of it, do so remembering me. In the same manner also, he took the cup and after he had poured the cup and blessed it, he held it up to him and he said, this, this is the New Testament and it's written in my blood. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. We know this. That communion is a mysterious participation with God. So here's the rules. If Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, this is your meal. You're welcome. If you have children and you would like them to come up and take communion, the table is open to them. The table is open to our kids. And I've had people say, Eric, they don't call me Pastor Eric when they say it. They just call me Eric. Like, Eric, I don't agree with that. I don't think kids should be at the table. They don't understand what's going on. If understanding the mystery of what goes on in the spiritual realm when we obey Christ and take that bread and that juice, if knowing and understanding the mystery is the rule, then I'm out. I don't understand it all. I just know this, that Jesus died for me. And he said, whenever you eat the bread and drink of the cup, remember me. And we do it in faithful participation. And our kids should see and experience the grace we live under. We are broken, but in him we are made whole. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for who you are. And we pray, come Lord Jesus, as we attend to communion, as we open our hearts to take part in that faithful walking down and receiving of the body and blood, Lord, may we do so in humility. I pray that for all who are in Christ Jesus who live under condemnation today and feel like they're not worthy, that they would truly know they're not worthy, but in Christ they are made worthy. In Christ they are brought home. And I pray that none who is in Christ would refuse to come. I pray that you would bring all to you, Lord Jesus Christ, through the witness of us, your broken people, who understand our lives are but dust and we have made some big mistakes, but they are not beyond your redemption. May your grace rest upon us as we receive these elements. In Christ's name, amen. We kept you super long today, and I'm not sorry at all. I am so glad you joined us for worship today. I am so thankful that you guys gave us the opportunity to walk with you, with you through profession of faith. If you haven't gotten a chance because we didn't give you a chance to greet, come down, give these new members some love, shake hands, introduce yourself. I know a lot of family wants to hug you. Well done. Well done with that. Thank you for joining us today for worship, for communion, and gathering as the body of Christ. As you go, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you, and may the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is time for the church to leave the building. My friends, you are dismissed.